welcome to Educational Zip Ties with your hosts, Heather Mitchell, Kimberly Acido Tanig, and me, show producer Joshua Hicks. Welcome to Educational Zip Ties. We are your hosts, Heather Mitchell. Hey! Kimberly Acido Tanig. That's me. Along with show producer, producer, we're just going to leave that in. I'm tired of doing it over and over. Joshua Hicks. We aim to set educators free, sponsored by TCCA, the Technology and Curriculum Conference of Alding, coming your way in October. Edu heroes assemble. All right, guys. So for today's hot topic, who are we? Where are we going with this podcast? And what's the hot topic for this session? I was thinking we could talk about Winter Storm Yuri. Uh, it's a couple of couple of weeks in the past now, but sounds like something we might want to talk about the educational impact and how do teachers recover from this. So let's start with Kimberly. Don't call me Kim, Kimberly. And then Heather, and then I'll probably <laughs> chime in at the end just a little bit, sprinkle sprinkle it in from the producer side. So Kimberly, let's let's hear a little bit about something, uh, a little bit about you and then we'll move on into the deeper subjects of three inches of snow. Well, I do have over 25 years of experience in education and um, my master's in instructional technology. And I've done various roles from classroom teachers to coaching to mentoring and um, being a digital learning specialist for a very large district in Houston, Texas. Ooh, it's me. My turn. That's Tag, you. I'm in. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I'm not quite a quarter yet. <laughs> so I'm more uh, two dimes. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, so I have 20 years in education um, and strictly elementary, uh, to be honest. I pretty much worked in about maybe three or four districts in the Houston area. Um, strictly, I've taught everything in elementary. Um, I have a master's in administration and a master's in curriculum currently working on a doctoral degree um and i'm a tech here i'm a digital learning specialist in aldine and i love it um lots to learn and um ready to talk about all these snow topics <laughs> <laughs> so what i heard in all that was you like to spend a lot of money going to school school <laughs> absolutely that is correct that would be correct okay well I, i'll keep it short and sweet on me i'm just the producer um I'm not at my two dimes or my quarter. I'm at 19. So I would be the, the shortest guy here. Um, and I've been working in a lot of people don't realize I have my degree in educate in uh, elementary education, taught at the elementary level for eight years and then moved to middle and then high school. The deeper topics of snow. Well, first off, what are what is educational zip ties? What do we want it to be as a show, guys? I mean, this is our first episode, as everybody knows, because I'm going to put that in the description. Um, what do you think about the name educational zip ties? What does it mean for you? I, I will. I'll speak. Did, um, and to be honest, I just think that um, in regards the name to zip, creators, yeah, you know, the zip ties. I think you know, it's kind of like. Um, Right now, we, we can educate and zip through the topics that are important, but just really to let people know that we're just the average educators um, and we're feeling the brunt of things that everybody else is feeling the brunt of. Um, and hopefully we can kind of highlight some of those topics and get a few people to give us a thumbs up, you know, and what we talk about, to be honest. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of times you guys, we, we seem to have our hands tied with um different ideas yeah they just they want to tie us up and in, into different ideas and information and news and things like that from the educational field and it just spins your head around mm. i mean what what is the word of the day that we've got to worry about when it comes to education pivot <laughs> pivot what's the what are some of the past ones because yeah i was thinking pivot when i said that but uh that's best this. practices was one that used to get on my nerve when I was in a uh, classroom. I was like, if I hear best practices one more time, blended weren't learning. Oh God. Uh, hybrid, hybrid, asynchronous, synchronous right now. Yeah. Those are the, those oh, are yeah. the words. 
they even made up something so that they could sound it sounded better than asynchronous because we couldn't figure out what asynchronous meant like there was a what was that it was they went from asynchronous hybrid to asynchronous to what was it oh. something about not being in attendance or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I I've say, heard that I want to be that person. I don't know, but I want to be that person because apparently that person makes uh, money with the research-based practices. Um, so I, I want to be that person. <laughs> so I think what you just mentioned right there is a big point. It's it's all based on money. Changing those words is all about the money. Absolutely. So you change a word and you tie it to your to something you're getting paid for and you make more money. I remember educational duct tape and teaching like a pirate. Um, oh, yes. oh yeah yeah oh Those, that is teaching like a pirate wow mm -hmm. everybody had the i think the books over there on the shelf everybody was reading all that stuff and and walking around at conventions and, and conferences going Arr. <laughs> yeah right now the hot hot button person of course is uh john hattie he is the man with the plan right now so that's where we're on and we're going to ride that train until somebody else new comes along. Right. So that's kind of what we're going to get into with educational zip ties. Where are we at? The week in review, two weeks in review. And what are some hot topics we need? We want to address. I mean, just to kind of chat about them. Doesn't mean we'll solve any problems. Just, just to let you all know, we're not solving any problems. But given that we are sponsored by the Technology and Curriculum Conference of Aldine, we hope that you'll attend so that you can seek out some of these answers for yourself. First topic, Winter Storm Yuri. How did it affect you, us personally? What is the exponential effect with students? Uh, did pivoting to online immediately work? And what are some of the struggles students and teachers face? What do you think there, Kimberly? You know, <laughs> here we have this winter, unprecedented winter storm in the middle of our unprecedented pandemic that we're still uh, dealing with. So we are going in from one crisis to another, just with an, um, How many good. unprecedented floods and how many unprecedented hurricanes? And then they're telling us the hurricane season is going to start early. Uh, early and it's going to be another big one, uh, what the predictions are looking at right now. So I'm tired of unprecedented. I think I'm just tired of living history right now. <laughs> yeah, one in 100 right. year events. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's 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 challenging everybody. Um, I definitely, you know, we have these uh, cascading disasters happening one right after another. And of course, living here in Houston, Texas, we're always dealing with the hurricanes and the floods. Um, it's always heartwarming to see how a community comes together, but I feel, um, you know, teachers have had to change the way we work, live, breathe, and educate all our students. And um, it's, I think it's wearing on everybody. You know, you can't teach effectively when the basic needs aren't met. And Winter Storm Uri was that strong reminder that we need those basic needs of food, water, and shelter and security before you can educate the students. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna jump in here. First of all, I am uh, today years old <laughs> when I really found out that the storm was named Uri. Had no clue. So, um, <clears throat> Yuri did a Eureka Bull event. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, Yuri did did damage. Um, and of course, because I'm a Southern bred, don't know nothing about the North. Okay, I am below the Mason Dixon line for life. So that um, I can say that, of course, we managed. You know, I mm -hmm. have gas in the home and everything. But in regards to the students, I think the issue in regards to the rolling blackout, of course, you know. <laughs> and it was, every time I did have power to see the fact that the news media was able to say that certain schools were still having online classes. And I was thinking, who's having online in Texas? Yeah, how's that <laughs> possible? How's that working? <laughs> and I got to have electricity to be able to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. So so for that, of course, that's definitely a concern. Um, and of course, 
possibly if there was a device that was powered up long enough and if you were able to take whatever it was in whatever course and have it downloaded, you know, maybe they were able to do it. But for the most part, um, I just think that how to be prepared for that, we really just that right there. I don't think we as, you know, the people we, we couldn't as a school set, setting, I think we were as best prepared as we could. Devices are out they're in the hands. But if you have no power. No yeah, and, yeah. And and one of the things I, I, I really wondered about was one, when's the transition time? Because I am from up north and I've been marveling at how they pivoted so well to. Uh, snow days being online days, but then talking with family from up there, I realized, well, they still have their power. They still have their water because their houses are hardened to that. Their power grids hardened to that. And it's easier for a school district to say tomorrow is going to be online. You have to be there till 11 o'clock after that, go out and enjoy the snow. Um, but here I thought it was very interesting that they were trying to do that on Friday when I was still having power flashes till Friday night. Uh, Saturday was the first day my power didn't go on or off at any point during the day. And yeah. I was a couple of other observations I had was, did anybody hear the eerie sound of their pipes freezing? Did, any, did you, either of you catch that? Uh, that's that noise it makes as the, the pipes were freezing or thawing? No, I did not. It wow. was... I got up at uh, 6 a.m. Monday morning. My power had been out since 3 in the morning, and I had left my water running, and I had a, I have a generator. So I was going outside to get the generator at first light, getting it started up so I could run a little bitty space heater in my bedroom to keep me warm. The house was in the low upper 50s, but, of course, all my pipes. And, and this one thing, if you're outside of Texas, you may not realize, or, or above that Mason-Dixon line, uh, the water stuff is all in the attic. We don't have basements. They don't run it through the concrete floor. They put it in the attic, which is very helpful to us during the summer because it gets hot here, as many of you may should realize, but you may not. So if you put a hot water heater in your attic and your attic is 130 degrees already, you spend less money on heating water because it's up there in that stove as it is, you know, in that oven. Yep, efficiency. Right. So the pipes are all just run through the floorboards of the attic in the, in amongst the rafters. And over the years, your insulation will settle exposing those pipes. And if you don't have other insulation to throw down over them, it's easy for them to freeze because of course there's no insulation on the roof. So there's just basically a shingle barrier between your pipes and the exterior. So it's easy for them to freeze. I did hear when I got up that morning was walking out. Uh, the sinks were all running, uh, trick not a tr not a drop but trickling, and I used the bathroom and the toilet didn't run. So I was going, oh great, the toilets are frozen. Both both toilets were frozen. Checked them both. Then as I was walking outside, I could hear this uh, sound like if you ever walk onto ice on a pond or ice on a lake, the cracking sound cracking, that ice yes. that ice makes. That was what was coming from up in my attic where my hot water heater was at. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was standing there going, well, there's nothing to do but to go top fire up the, the generator. If they pop, they pop. I can't do a thing about it. I'm here on Friday. We're, oh, we're going online. We're going online. And I'm going, I have no power. What are you talking about? And my neighbors on both sides of me, one guy had 16 different burst pipes. Another one had three, but they, they cascaded through the uh, – one neighbor on one side had 16 burst pipes and one neighbor on the other had three and the three had, he wasn't home. He had taken his younger kids and gone to his mom and dad's and they had um, destroyed his daughter's bedroom, his hallway and his master bedroom. And I'm just sitting here Man. going, how is a kid supposed to start doing online education if their bed and their bedroom just got flooded and everything's covered in this white gooey, drywall mess oh yeah or that or even just trying to um you know go with the family to get water because in many places right the water's pipes burst so they need to go they were getting those necessities going to get food going to get water mm -hmm. um yeah school was definitely the last thing on people's minds Absolutely. and if you can't get on 
you can't get on. There's no controlling whether you have electricity, even though you have that device at home and that router or Wi-Fi available. I know um, our experiences during this, and we were very fortunate. We had the loss of power and the rolling blackouts and but we fortunately didn't have any water issues and being from the Midwest and preparing for storms, we had already stocked up on food and had our gas stove that we could still cook during this time. Um, but the lack of information, because when we did not have power, we were completely cut off. Like uh, Heather, I mentioned earlier that she didn't even know that the storm had a name um, because our cell phones weren't working. So when we didn't have power, it wasn't just the lack of the battery. It was that the cell phone towers were down. And so we weren't connected to anybody. There was no way for us to get news to see where we're at and what's happening around us. That was a big surprise to me because even during the hurricanes, I've been able to get a lot of information through my cell phone. Yeah. If AT and T might go down, but Verizon would be up, mm -hmm. and so we have. Personally, I have an AT and T phone, but then I have a Verizon work phone. One of the two usually can get through to get information. Yeah, so, I was very shocked the fact that we even are through our cell phones we weren't getting service. Uh, or the the week after, some of the camp, some of the districts were sending kids back to school that Monday. Others held off for a couple of days. And, um, and, you know, here in Aldine, we took two days off and then we did an uh, e-learning day on Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday, we were back face to face. I applaud that plan. I, I liked that plan. I thought it addressed some needs with some of, with our families. Very, it was a good balance. I thought. I did feel it was a good balance. And I, I appreciate the fact that there wasn't that urgency and that rush to get back to school because they knew that everybody had different situations going on and, and were a different place as far as what needs need to be addressed. And so school was not the priority at that time. Yeah, um, I, I would agree. I would definitely agree. I think, but the only thing, of course, I, I, I could have taken those last two days those last two days, you know, for those of us that had other things that we were mm -hmm. trying to figure out, you know, in regards to even though we had water, we were wondering what's going on with the pressure of the water, you know, that kind of thing. So it's kind of or the lack thereof of, you know, food in certain grocery stores. I, I can still tell you that that has been even this weekend, you know, just trying to get certain right. foods that are common. I the agree. stores have not, you know been able to really restock because people were scrambling for food and yeah. that within itself is I mean how can you even focus on education a job or what have you and you don't have food I, yeah. I was amazed that the lines for those particular fast food places that of course had power the lines were ridiculous oh, yes but yeah. I understand because you're starving. If you have mm -hmm. electricity, and I'm saying you work on the from an electric stove, how, yeah. what were you eating? If everything was, you know, in the refrigerator or what have you, and some maybe of that they probably just wanted a hot meal because they had yeah. food, yeah. but it wasn't, you know, they couldn't yeah. prepare it, and yeah. this place could. So, yeah. So I'll be I, honest, I, I would have liked, I would have liked to have had those, you know, two after days, four but, days in my bedroom with a space heater. I went to McDonald's and you're right. I was shocked. I did not see the shelves as bare during the beginning weeks of COVID as I did, or even during Hurricane Harvey yeah. or Ike than I did this last week <laughs> yeah. or two weeks Agreed. ago. Agreed. Agreed. Um, it's funny too, when the pandemic started, you know, you couldn't find what toilet paper, paper mm -hmm. towels, uh, uh, you know, sanitizer and Lysol and stuff like that. And, here it is a couple weeks after the storm and I went to the store this weekend and the milk is still low. The refrigerated mm -hmm. and freezer sections are still just bare minimum and mm -hmm. how long it's taking them to come back in and restock. Absolutely. And, you know, coming, looking towards the future, how this is going to affect the price of foods because our, we had a big loss of crops yeah. and so forth because of this winter storm. Absolutely. 
Yeah, the first thing I noticed on my Facebook feed when I got back was uh, Facebook and Insta. I follow the farmer's market over in Tomball, Texas. Uh, all of the garden places, all of the, the fresh produce places were saying, yeah, we're not going to be at the farmer's market for about three to five weeks, maybe longer. They had no way to protect them other than to put plastic over them. The stuff still died. Mine did. Uh, I, Everything is brown. Yes. It's ugly. I ate it. But anyway, <laughs> I managed to save one plant because I put a bucket over it and that was enough. My yard man came in and <laughs> trimmed trimmed back all the, the dead and my now you can see all where I need to paint my house. <laughs> so you were you were trying to save your plants and honestly in our home that was one of the last things we were thinking about. Um we were making sure that we were covering our pipes as much as we can mm -hmm. and played around in the attic trying to because we had just had um a water heater and a leak in the attic over Christmas break. Um so we were trying to make sure that everything was covered and secured in that manner. And um, so the plants were the last thing on my mind. <laughs> and we <laughs> lost our azalea brush. It's gone. <laughs> oh, no. Madison said it sounded like a Sasquatch was in the uh, attic. Yeah, my husband spent a lot of time in the attic before the storm came in, just looking for every little place where he could try it to secure it. They yeah, work. it did. We were successful in that. Um, we also kept the attic door open, open yeah, we while did we had heat. But man, yeah. oh my gosh, the minute we lost electricity and did not have heat, we had to get that closed quickly because yes. the houses here are built to get rid of the heat. Unlike where I'm from and grew up, I grew up in northern Indiana, those houses are really well insulated to protect from the cold. And here, we're the opposite. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get rid of the heat. So the minute you lose power, the heat is gone. I couldn't believe how fast the fast house they'd live. Yeah. got cold. Yeah. Yeah. My thermostat worry. said 38 degrees when my electricity came on and the heater kicked on. Yeah. Inside, inside the and house. The, and the amount of time it took to heat the whole entire home. Mm -hmm. Like it, it seemed like I was like, okay, I know they're telling us to preserve, you know, be conservative with the power. And I'm thinking, I need to bump this up a couple of, you know, cause uh, it's freezing. It was still cold. Mm -hmm. It took, it took a long time to at least, you know, get to the point where you were able to, walk around just in decent clothing you know instead of having three and four layers of clothes on yeah, yeah. <laughs> living in the hoodie with the hood actually up and mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and us talking about all this i think it, what we need to keep in mind is you know because this is supposed to be educational um that students are dealing with the same thing absolutely um, oh yes and a lot of our students might be living in an apartments where that pipes burst three apartments up from them yeah. And comes cascading down on them. They're at the bottom floor getting dumped on by the two two people, two sets of apartments above them. And, uh, you know, then you, you talk into a lot of a, a transient population or um, others who maybe they, they have no money to buy that hot food or anything like that because they're out of a job because of COVID or, you know, they have recently become unemployed. So I think one of the things w when we talk about the need and the necessity to be able to p pivot to online learning so quickly and seamlessly, I think we've really got to stop and think about that balance and work on making sure that we're not putting people in a difficult position with expectations of attendance when they're not able to. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, Again, it goes back to meeting those basic needs. You can't. Mm -hmm it affects learning and you can't teach and learn effectively if you are worried about where you're going to get your next meal or, you know, how this, <laughs> when's your room going to be put back together and now you've got to replace all those right. items damaged in the water. And exactly. Um, not to mention just, just that, but I, you know, it goes back to the educator, you know, it's always where the educator when you speak of our theme, you know, I, I do think of educators as superheroes. It's almost where they literally have to, no matter pandemic, no matter your pipes, <laughs> you know. So, no, with that being said, I was just saying, you know, in regards to educators having to deal with the same theme and the theme that we have, you know, that theme speaks a lot about educators, period. Um, 
always having to come in and save the day because many times and I, I can say this for me, being in the classroom, I, I've, I've been dealing with personal things, but yet I have to put on that face, you know, kind of go into my closet and come out, a car, you know, to Clark Kent, you know, come out or Wonder Woman or what have you. And yet, you know, make it brighter for those kids um, and, and do my job as well as, you know, make them feel comfortable. So that says a lot about our theme and it speaks to, you know, the things that we have dealt with um, just within this the past two years. So oh, yes, absolutely. Or superheroes, you know, yeah. It because yeah. they do. They have to come in and make those kids feel comfortable and secure, and and be chipper. And and what's weighing in the back of their mind is is their parent that's, you know, in the hospital with COVID, or their house yeah. that has been you still doesn't have water, and so they they didn't get a shower before they got to come into work and do their thing. So yes, our educators are definitely definitely bringing to the forefront yeah. everything we do all right let's wrap this up then let's go with 12 seconds and sum up winter storm yuri kimberly honestly i think winter storm yuri definitely made us again very aware of our vulnerability um in communities and taking a look at um how we can better address uh, being prepared for things like this and still moving forward and educating our students and just for everybody keeping it together. You know, this has been taxing mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, and we keep doing what we do. So kudos to educators. Heather. I would have to say the same, you know, um, of course, kudos to educators, but um, and I don't even want to get on the leadership and voting and all that because that's going to go to something else. Um, we know what we have to do. Of course, we need to exercise our right, you know, for those that understand exactly what we go through. But I do feel like um, we do have to be prepared. And it shows us down south that we need to be prepared in the wintertime like we prepare in the summer for, you know, hurricane season, you know. Yes. <laughs> we definitely have to, you know, stock up on the water. Um you know, and I, I just speaking neighborhood app, it's like everybody on that next door app is going crazy when they see old generator sale or what have you. But I mean, just being prepared, the preparedness is almost like an educator, you know, being prepared for what anything to happen in the classroom. It's the same yeah. thing. And we're all in this together and then we work Absolutely. better together. So I, I hope that that continues to move forward and, you know, everybody remembers yeah. that moving forward and works together to the spirit uh, of man, just mankind is really, absolutely. I mean, that has been absolutely outstanding. Outstanding. <laughs> so I'll sum it up with uh, Amazon shopping list. <laughs> Everything that I need to be prepared for the next one is now on a list. <laughs> and I've already started every paycheck. You know, I'm, I'm buying one thing and I already started with a space heater from Amazon Essentials. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> yeah. It brings me back to that movie. Well, I forget that movie. What was that movie? The Storm? Was it called Storm? Uh, the Day After Tomorrow. Day After. T that is it. Exactly. Yep. That was the sound. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. All crazy. right. Question of the week. Spring break's coming up. Sand, snow, or book? <sighs> Gosh. I was, I was going to add another B on there, but anyway, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> you know, I think for me, hiking, hill country. <laughs> okay, Heather. I think we're gonna have to touch some sand. We, we we're gonna have to put our toes in the sand. Yeah. Yeah, I think this year it's gonna be sand for me too. Normally it's snow, but this year I think it's gonna be sand, given <laughs> what we just went through. You've had yep. enough of snow. I've had you this. Your I'm, I'm good with it. But uh, all right. Well, let's wrap this up. Um, we'll be back in two weeks with another episode. We're going to try and do this um, educational zip size every two weeks. Want to do a big thank you to our sponsor, TCCA, the Curriculum Conference or Technology and Curriculum Conference of Aldean. Um, it's the biggest free curriculum conference in Texas, 11 years running. This year, the theme is Edu Heroes Assemble, because as we discussed, educators are heroes too. So if you want to find us and follow us, find us at. Okay, great. So um, you can find Heather Mitchell at on Twitter at Heather Mitch underscore nine four. 
please look at, I don't I don't tweet just education or anything but I do retweet a lot of things um and it just bear with me on there but yeah that's me Heather Mitch underscore nine four on Twitter and you can find me at Acido Tanig A C I T O T A N I G on Twitter and I'm on all the social medias at JP Big Boy. Don't forget to keep up with your TCCA news at tccaconference.com or at tccaconf, T-C-C-A-C-O-N-F. And we thank everybody for joining us. Check yes, with us next you. time. Talk Toodles. to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>